So what I'm hearing from this group is why we're here is uh, we're looking for clear and easy ways to convey our somewhat complex work. And um, we're looking to uh, get perspectives from others and um, both looking to be very specific storytelling around fundraising, um, around um, organizational, like founding stories. Um, so the <laughs> yeah, this is this is kind of generally what we're going to be going through. And um, in terms of uh, stories in general, um, I'm wondering why it is that you think you should care about stories. Why why should why should I care about your story? Okay. Why are you about your story? All the work that we do resonates. It's a legal way of transferring knowledge and across the middle of it, and it kind of um, makes people feel like you do in a way that not all copywriting necessarily does, or other texts, you know, like kind of connecting with that piece that's very human mm -hmm. what you do, or that brings it to a level of people who understand the passion and the feeling inside of it is really what spurs people out of action, connects people with what you're doing, connects people with all kinds of successes. So thank you, Robin. So just for any of you at the back who couldn't hear, it's uh, this is about creating a resonant story um, and with an age-old method that is a more compelling type of communication than most of the other copy that most of us that are nonprofits would produce. Um, anyone else have any thoughts? Okay, so oh yeah. Well there's so many causes out there that are good that just appeal to the intellect and if you hit them in the cut in the heart and get them crying then there'll be advocates for you and really yeah. engaged. So we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit. Um, so uh, get them in the gut, get them crying, it's an important cause, don't try to be so rational. Um, we're actually going to talk about some research around that. Um, there's three points here for you to think about. Um, again, these slides will be available so you don't need to take them. You know, but victories are rare. And that's really important to remember is that most of us want to go back to our constituency, back to our supporters and we have a victory, but we really need to bring them into the process of creating change. And that that's what's compelling to um, people because they want to know what's next. They want to stay involved. Um, they want to be part of the emotional roller coaster that is our work. Um, there's a, recently a study at MNR and they do um, but research for nonprofits, and uh, they talked about how uh, people don't relate to numbers or manipulation. Indeed, Goodman also talks about this numbers now. Um, but that doesn't mean numbers aren't really important. Um, we need to find explaining stories that help to convey the importance of this information in a way that we can relate to. And they have to be compelling stories that share the emotional aspects of our work. Um, Though many of us shy away from the emotional because we're looking for legitimacy, we're looking for respect from our uh, policy favor audiences, um, we often lose this very important piece of our work. So um, it's, it's important not to you know, basically manipulate uh, the feelings of our audience because that's as, as much of a, uh, where we can get bored with numbers, we can also uh, get turned off by manipulation. Um, it's really finding that balance. And third, um, this is about motivating and modeling change. So we need to vision for our audiences what this, this process of um, creating a new future looks like. Because more, than, more often than not, we can be very vague about a specific legislature, <laughs> legislative change that we want, but it doesn't really resonate with me as an individual living in, you know, this province and this city and this country. So we need to make it real and to make it something that people can see and relate to emotionally. So, um, and Nature Stick, a great resource for all of those who are new to storytelling, um, the success model to discover, but really speaks to this ability to be specific and simple, um, it's, it's a great resource. So just hands up, just give me some examples where you use stories in your work right now. Any 
Because <laughs> <laughs> I would be in the cellar and you would see it behind you. Um, well, lots of places. Like, first of all, I run a digital storytelling project. So you know, my, my work with all of the storytelling has a kind of place making and doing community. Um, but I often tell stories, for example, to funders. Mm -hmm. I, I try to craft really great stories so that projects come to life for funders and they want to get involved. So that's one example. Great. Um, Anyone else have other examples for them where the stories come uh, alive for them to be able to get volunteers? Motivating volunteers, attracting volunteers, it's also I produce video and the, the most compelling features are always the, the stories that people share. Mm. More so than the information that they do. Yeah. yeah, so it's, it's having that radar to listen for stories uh, throughout our organizations. Yeah, great. So here's a few examples. Um, a really great thank you letter that tells the parks, the donors, you know, what their money did really shares how there was an effective outcome, a person was touched, um, a kitten was saved, you know. <laughs> these, these are the things that people care about, right? You know, there's the number that, you know, 30,000 kittens were saved over three years, and that's great, but if you're able to talk about this one really cute kitten, and like, you know, that's, that's what matters to me. <laughs> Most of us work in larger issues than saving, but um, I'd, be, I'd be surprised what a good story did. Um, so um, we use at our websites with these images that tell stories about our work. We use um, uh, where we can engaging content written by people, written by individuals. Um, that help to create a personal relationship between the reader and the teller. Um, some of us write really good pithy Twitter updates that make people wonder what's next and what's more and why should I click on that and it cuts through the clutter that is that, that Twitter fire hose of information. So, um, and videos, we're hearing a lot of people in the room who are doing videos and we'll hear that more of this uh, work is actually on here. Um, that really shows our work in action, really captures the crisis or the challenge that we're facing. I think that the, a good video um, is hard to do, but with them well, um, can really convey a, a lot of information. So here's an example um, brought to us by Sea Change Strategies. So here's a nonprofit website that some of you may recognize that um, is rather staid and is pointing to statistics that where we have a bar chart um, that shows a 40% reduction in, <laughs> in um, our homeless or unsheltered population. Um, so, you know, it's, it's great. This is, this is a wonderful number, but I don't really know what Common Ground does. <laughs> you know, I, there's nothing really here for me to sink my teeth into. And um, this is an important stat, but, um, if given some context, uh, it might be more relevant. And what I what I think might uh, tell the story a bit better is if we were to meet uh, Laura here. And Laura is um, is kind of struggling with meth addiction for most of her life, and you can really see it in her face. And we get to know the benefits of common ground by seeing the change in Laura. And we can see, look at the difference in her face. Look at, there, there's such a, a vibrant change that we can really feel. Um, and she just looks so much healthier and happier. And you can see that she's finding opportunities to, um, to really find more meaning in her life and her work. And that's Common Ground created this opportunity. So this is a, this is a powerful moment that needs to be shared, and the stats just don't share that power. And so what we need to do is find those moments and, um, and share them more readily, be more honest and vulnerable with those stories. So, so what we're going to do is hear a bit about this process of vulnerability. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the Workers Action Center is taking a really amazing 
media outreach they've done and um, translating it more to digital storytelling uh, for us. So, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Karen, and uh, Karen is going to uh, give us some insight into this for Thank you. So thanks. Um, process of vulnerability. Wow. <laughs> That's what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> Um, so, uh, as Kasi said, I'm from the Workers Action Center. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of our small nonprofit organization. Has anyone ever heard of us? Yep, that's great. So, for those of you who don't know who we are, uh, we're a very small organization that uh, works with people. We have a hotline, we have legal clinics. Um, people come into us with call our hotlines with a problem at work. So, someone might not have been paid, someone might have been fired. They call us to find out. Um, how my rights being violated, and more importantly, what do I do? So people come in through that process of support, um, but more importantly, um, the bigger piece of work we do is really we try to pressure our provincial government, uh, mostly the Ministry of Labor, to do a better job of protecting workers' rights. So when people come to us, we do work with them directly on their case, um, but we try to bring people into um, the broader base, our sort of base of support, uh, where our campaigns come out of. So we're constantly running a campaign um, that is somehow putting pressure on our Ministry of Labor or our provincial government. Um, so about a year before we launched our campaign, which was on May 13th, um, we brought our workers together, our members together, to test out <coughs> if our campaign demands were still relevant to people. And so we brought people together and we tested out what we had been using in the past. And we thought we need to jazz it up, we need to shake it up a little bit, to make it more creative. But we need to make sure that it's still grounded um, where people are at. These are the folks who are going to be taking the campaign out into the community. And so does it still resonate with those folks? So I wanted to start just at that point at the beginning um, of how our campaign is grounded in people's experiences. Um, so I'm not sure in the work that you do if you have already a community that you work with. Do most people have people or community members, people that you're trying to mobilize and organize? Yes, and some people are saying no. All right. So we're lucky in that we have people coming to us all the time, and that sort of builds a base of people that then we can mobilize to get the camp. Um, so as I said, a year before we launched our campaign, we brought people together just to sit down at people's kitchen tables at a coffee time, invited people to the Workers' Action Center to say, what is happening to you at work? What are the kinds of experiences that you or your family, your friends are experiencing? And so people started to talk about very low wages. Uh, every job they went to, there was some kind of violation of their rights. Um, being fired unjustly and fairly just kicked out like that. So people talked about um, very similar things. So at the Workers Action Center, we were able to see those trends and relate them to what our demands were. We also heard from people not just about what they were experiencing at work, but the impact that it had on them. So people said, when I go to work and my boss screams or yells at me every single day, you know, it's a matter of dignity, it's a matter of respect. People said there's so much unfairness in everything I go through. So it may be legal, but it's still very unfair what happens to me on a daily basis. And that's really hard for me to go home to my family and feel a sense of pride at bringing home the bacon when I'm kicked around all day by my boss at work. So we also heard about the impact and make sure that we integrate that stuff into our campaign as well. So what did people tell us? People told us that we need better enforcement of our laws. Uh, people told us that uh, we need higher wages, that people can't really survive off of our general minimum wage. And people told us that, you know, we're not even covered by the law anymore. The laws were written in the 1960s, and now in the 21st century, a lot of us are not even protected by the small scope that our law covers. And so we said, okay, those are then our three demands. We need better enforcement, we need an updated set of laws, and we need better um, we need improved wages. And so those experiences shaped our campaign goals, shaped our demands. And so for us, that's one of the most important things. We just talked to a group of people who said, oh, we've done this. Uh, you know, we decided this was an idea that the staff had. 
And we came back and said, really? Uh, it needs to be based in the experience of, your, of the people that you're working with. I don't know about you, but when you're talking from the heart, uh, it elicits more passion than just talking from a fact sheet um, on a podium. Uh, it's more natural. So if you're going to ask people to talk about their experience, it should be something that they experience every day and that they feel every day. So our member said, okay, what is something that we do every day? We look for work and we know the confidence that employers feel when they tell us about these, give us these offers that are completely illegal. So let's document that experience that we have. So I'm going to show a short video. Uh, sitting in someone's kitchen one afternoon, we decided we'll get the classified ads out, we'll call some employers, and we'll report it. And that way we'll be able to use this as a tool to explain what we do or what people experience every day. And I'll tell you what we're, how we use this video. to take their experience and to somehow creatively get it out there into the public. And so with this video, uh, what we did is we um, attached it to an email and we sent it out to all of our contacts uh, across Toronto but also across the province. And we um, asked people to send an email to the Minister of Labour saying, you know, how can wage theft happen in Ontario? Um, we urge you to stop wage theft. And so the minister was inundated with, um, with emails. And so we used it, one, to educate people on what people's experiences are. Maybe many of you have never had an experience like this and don't really know what it's like for people who face this every day. Um, and so people said, I want people to see it. I want people to see, to feel what I feel. Um, but also to use it as a, as a tool to get your message out there and to connect people to our campaign. I do have, um, Chad Moore with me, who is our uh, web guy and who is our uh, graphic designer. And so hopefully at some point you can um, talk to him about the kind of results that we get when we send out an email like this, the kind of spikes that, um, that hits on our website are just kind of cool. So it's a really good tool. Um, it draws people to your website, it draws people to your work. We often get lots more calls after we send something like this. So. Does anyone have any comments about Anything that I've just talked about in the video? Yeah? Did you have any debate about the use of the word demands? In terms of, I've seen use of the word demands in campaigns to build resistance, and also if you've really got them in the corner, then it works. Right. So did you have a conversation with them? 
Uh, we don't. I know that a lot of people are maybe thinking that demands is a little bit harsh. We are a political organization and we are not a charitable organization. We can be very open about our politics. I know for a lot of nonprofits or who are ch have charitable status, you can't be as open. Um, and so that you might want to say goals or objectives or, you know, I saw on the first website that it said, you know, our goal is to end homelessness. Um, for us, we say, you know, we demand an end to wage theft um, because we want to um, convey that sense of urgency that, you know, people are really thrown into crisis when their wages are stolen by an employer. Any other comments or questions? So were those plants basically like were that, that we're calling or because you have both sides of the conversation, so like were you sending people into those situations or having them call to, yeah. to discuss the job? No, we just sat. Uh, we sat at someone's kitchen table, and we had the um, old recording device. You put out. Oh, a, so there was a script. Like they weren't actually real. No, we just went. We went. They are real oh, interactions, phone. and we just yeah. called in the classified random calls. And That's you know, some mean, of them weren't that. like this, but most of the ones that we got, people are saying, you know, I have to work 60 hours a week and get paid only 400. Yeah. 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 It was very simple. <laughs> Um, so the second thing I wanted to, to mention is just um, knowing who your target is. Like what change are you trying to make? And for us it's very clear, we know that we need better enforcement, we need better laws. Um, so the, at the Workers' Action Center we, have very, we went through a, a process of people identifying who would our targets be, who do we have to move in order to see the change that we need. So as a workers' rights organization, who might be one of our targets? Who might we want to press? Yep. Um, employers. Definitely. So um, employers are definitely uh, a target. And so the way we might use that target is, you know, if someone tells their story, um, on your desks, um, some of you, I've put a media story um, a few weeks ago in the Toronto Star, two living caregivers uh, decided to come public, to go public with their story. Um, and so they're able to tell the story of their bad employers, but it's a way to demonstrate the broader systemic issues that people come in through the Living Caregiver Program, they live with their boss, um, imagine that. Um, and people, um, you know, when you're tied to one employer and your immigration status is tied to one employer, it's really hard to speak out against that person. And so they told their story in the newspaper. It will also put pressure on the employer to pay the wages they're owed because they're now wrangling it out in, in court. So who else might be one of our targets? We've got bad bosses. Who else might we want to pressure to make changes for workers? Okay. Okay. Industry organizations. Uh, yeah, that could be one, like business associations and that. Okay. Yep. Who makes the laws? Who writes them? Sorry? Legislators. The legislators, right. So the government, are the provincial government and the Ministry of Labor, that's one of our biggest targets. They can raise the minimum wage, they can hire more enforcement officers, they can do a better job of enforcement. Um, and so the Ministry of Labor is definitely one of our targets, or provincial government. The, the government is sometimes very um, sensitive to negative publicity. And so again, in all of our videos, we've attached some sort of action to it. So at the end, uh, if you went onto our website, you'd see three other videos, which is asking you to take some sort of action to call the Minister of Labor, to email the Minister of Labor, um, so that they're constantly feeling our presence. And we've been asking for months and months for a meeting with the Ministry of Labor. Um, and they had sort of turned cold on us after um, a video we had put out last year against one of the bills they had passed. Um, but after we had sent three of these videos out, we now have a meeting with the Ministry of Labor. It's not a big victory, but it's um, it shows that that pressure really works. And I wanted to say that on May 12th, um, there's another um, story that some workers, some painters told from Tom Coat, um, put out their story on May 12th, and on May 13th, there's a story with the Minister of Labor talking about wage theft. So he's using our terminology, which is what we want to happen. In the states, they have lots of wage theft legislation, but we want to get that to be some, you know, a, a slogan, a term that the, the government is using. And then after the two living caregivers told their story, the very next day, on the 31st, 
we have another article with the Ministry of Labor saying we are committed to protecting the most vulnerable workers in Ontario and referencing the story and referencing the work that we did. So it's a good way, to, it's a good strategy, it's a good tool to keep yourself on the radar of whoever it is you're trying to move to change. Any questions or comments about that? Who might be our third and most important target? Who do we want to reach out to for all of these? Workers. Workers. Workers, exactly. And so keeping things clear and simple, um, keeping the story simple and resonating, um, people want to hear their stories reflected in the stories that we put out there. Um, even in our our campaign, um, our sort of our propaganda, I guess you'd say, or our outreach flyers, um, we have a story inside of Lilia. Uh, Lilia is in one of our videos, and so we say to people, you know, you can go to our website and you can hear Lilia's story. And so referring people through all of our tools to use one or another of the tools and always having an action piece attached to that. How do you scope workers? I mean, who do you consider workers? Because there's... I would say low-income workers, um, precarious workers, people who are working through temporary agencies. Where um, We might go to Scarborough Town Centre and hand out this flyer. Mm -hmm. We probably wouldn't go to Bay Street, right? So, but why not? Because they might they might work with you. Um, so we, might be. Um, yeah. Well, okay, put it this way. Like I'm not a worker mm -hmm. then, but I work, and I'm interested in your cause. So yeah. why wouldn't you appeal to me? Um, well, because I can help you. Yeah. Well, we would probably appeal to you as an ally for sure, right? As a support. I mean, maybe you are also someone who's in a precarious work. We want to keep the base of you know as contract workers or you know. Mm -hmm. So. We, we do target, our audience, I'd say, is low-income workers. But and why do you limit to that? Well, I, I'm just curious, because the more because people in your the, army can yeah. fight with you, right? Uh, that's, we that, that's a terrible term. I think it's really that empowerment as well, is that people who are really disfranchised, people who are isolated, um, you know, people who would never be able to come to one of these workshops, are probably not, are, are on, not on all the networks. And so it's trying to reach out to people who are working two or three jobs who are making less than the minimum wage. I'm, I'm not saying not to reach out to them, but yeah. why wouldn't you go broader? We're very small. Probably resources We're too. so small, yeah. Okay. We don't have the resources to go out. We would never go to Bay Street and try to rally folks on Bay Street because normally we're down there at the temp agencies yeah. or, but. Oh, no, I, I understand yeah. that. But you know, guys like Michael Pico, no, I, I'm not here to debate, but Michael Pico who started the Luminato, he was a Bay Street guy and got it done. Yeah. So just to wrap up, um, just really wanting to say that um, just making sure that those stories are really integrated into everything that we do, but just really that the that they have a message or a call to action. Um, a lot of times, you know, we see people getting stuck in that stage where you just create a story. But what are you trying to do? For us, it's trying. We're trying to bring people into our movement. We're trying to bring people into our campaign to support. So how does your how do your tools do that for you? How are you asking people to come in? But not only that, what are you inviting them into? So for us, it's about making sure we have a sustainable um, goal. We have a campaign with things that people can get involved in. Um, do you want? We don't use our, our tools for any fundraising. Um, we really just use our tools to to bring people in. Uh, to pressure our targets, to pressure an employer to pay, or the government to make some legislative change. Um, and all our flyers and materials are referring back to the website or referring to a video. Um, so trying to connect as many of your tools together so that people are getting the full gamut um, of the work that you're doing. And making it easy for them, like with the emails that people could send, it was just a link that like, people saw the text in the email, and then a little button submit, and it goes straight. And um, it had to be front and center, like right the very first thing on their homepage, because this is what you want people to do. You can't bury it six pages deep in the website. It's got to be as dead simple as possible for people to actually be able to do it, in my opinion. So just to clarify, so you embedded the video, you embedded the form, everything was really uh, on that home page. Yes. It's the most important thing to do this week is to take care of this idea. Yes.
And also, one of the things we didn't know, because we're definitely not techies, uh, we didn't have Chad, was uh, we were sending out a lot of these things, but we didn't know how to test it to see if it was working. Um, so, so we sent up, uh, you know, our first video in our, we didn't know how to make, you know, are people sending, are people viewing the video, are people sending the Minister of Labor an email, are people taking action? And so um, probably, I think many of you are more techy than we probably are at the Worker Center, but I think it's like, how do you test it to make sure it's working, and what is your, how do you evaluate if it's actually good enough or not? One of our videos maybe had 2,000 viewings, but another one might have had, you know, 150. So is that not good enough? You keep using that safe tool. So building in the evaluation, that's that's very important, especially when you're in these like. Can I ask what tool you use to uh, make those evaluations to capture the number of people? Um, they have Google Analytics for their yeah. website, which is amazing, and they use Mailchimp for their HTML emails, which is free up to. Uh, lists of 2,000 unique addresses and um, if you look at their their like the main dashboard in Google Analytics and it's you know the main thing it will show you a period of time and it will show you the number of hits they're getting per day and all of the spikes are absolutely directly related to when they send an email and then, like you don't even have to know the dates they sent email, you can tell just by looking at the chart. Because when you tell people or ask them to do something, that is when they're going to do it. People don't necessarily regularly stumble there, you have to tell them. So you send out an email, a little link to the video, a link to where you can send an email to the minister, and all of that. And all they have to do is click, and it's right in front of their face. And that is when the chances are best that people will actually take action. One more question for the fashion center. I don't have any other on this issue. Um, you, you said you sent you send a video by email. Yeah. Uh, is it more effective? That's not true. You can't actually send a video in an email. I mean, you send that, you send it later. I mean, sorry for that. I'm not taking it up. So, <laughs> did you find it more effective to use email and send it to your contacts rather than doing some sort of online campaign? Um, so, well, I guess I don't. We didn't. We decided not to do an online campaign. Um, why is yeah, it? I don't know why we didn't do that. Depends on your online campaign. Is it resource? Campaigns. I would consider email an online campaign. Yeah. So, okay. Do what you need social media? Yeah, social media, for example, do a, put, a, put the video on YouTube, things like that. It's on YouTube. The video is there. Okay, so you find, so from your experience, using email, sending it to a large number of contacts, like 2,500 email a day is effective, as long as you have a large list to send to. You know? If, if it's, there's no better way to get people to your website, like to, for, to give somebody a leaflet, which in a lot of cases you do, and there's lots of value in that, but to get somebody from that piece of paper to a website is a lot bigger leap than something that sits in their inbox that they just click a button and it goes. So easy and simple for them to do. Yeah. And I don't know about everyone else, but we, you know, we're based in Toronto, but I mean, we really want the pressure to be coming from across Ontario, across the province, and we can't re always reach out across to all our allies across the province. So it was easy for us to send it to our, our allies and supporters, like in Windsor and Kitchener-Waterloo and Hamilton, and to say, can you send this out so that, you know, you're, they're getting emails from Windsor and all across the province. So in terms of a tool that's beyond our reach, um, you know, we can't reach out to all those folks directly, but it was very helpful that way. Share the stories and screenshots and voiceover. Is it um, 
you know, going for on-site visits and you know, using the flip cam. And, you know, it, it's a, uh, they're really trying um, a bunch of different um, kind of methods for their stories and, and they're incorporating the feedback and they're working back into their campaign and they're getting successes. So you can see that they have, um, what I heard that really is important was that they really started with strategy. They re they're focused on their audience. They're focused on um, what is the pressure tactic? Who's going to respond to what? You know, does a minister like is, does this minister respond to hot or cold? You know, <laughs> is it you know are we putting his feet to the fire? Or are we shutting him out? You know, like is, is it um, is this uh, largely online? offline in kitchens and in church halls is a mix of those two uh, tactics. Uh, so, I, yeah, yeah, I don't know if you have any other thoughts, but uh, thank you again. That was really nice, Kathy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and please do uh, love it more because I think uh, we need more stories.